I'm Diana Marrero. Uh, welcome to the Hill's first ever Latina Leaders Summit. Bienvenidas. The summit is an initiative of the Hill Latino, a new English language portal I launched early last year on thehill.com. At the very outset, I would like to thank our premier level sponsor, PG&E, and supporting level sponsor, Telemundo, for making this event possible. As many of you know, the Hispanic population is growing rapidly across the United States, transforming entire communities and the nation itself. Yet Latinas in particular are underrepresented in leadership positions across the board. We're here today to explore issues with big implications, not just for Latinas, but for American leadership, the country's workforce, and the economy. What is needed to make leadership opportunities more accessible for people of color? What unique challenges do Hispanic women face in rising to management positions? How can current Latina leaders act as role models and mentors for the next generation of American leaders? This morning, we have gathered a stellar lineup of Latina leaders from government, education, business, and media for a dialogue on diversity, leadership, and building a pipeline of tomorrow's leaders. We also happen to have an impressive number of Latinas in the audience, including several women who made our Latina leaders to watch list in today's issue of The Hill, which you all have on your, on your chairs. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. In addition to our audience in attendance, we're live streaming on thehill.com. Please keep your phones on silent. However, we do encourage you to engage in the discussion on social media. You can follow us on Twitter at The Hill Events and comment using the hashtag The Hill Latina. We're going to be taking questions from the audience during the program, so please be on the lookout for members of our team with handheld mics. You can also tweet questions to our hashtag, The Hill Latina. Finally, there's a short feedback survey on your chairs. We would welcome uh, your comments, and I would encourage you to complete the survey at the end of today's program. So let's dive right in. We begin this morning with the very first Hispanic woman to serve in Congress. Congresswoman Ileana ross Leighton was born in Cuba and fled the island with her family as a young girl. They put down roots in Miami where the future congresswoman began working as a teacher. That inspired her to seek a career in public service. Now after decades representing Florida's 27th Congressional District, Ross Leighton is retiring from Congress, but I'm venturing to guess not from public service. I'm really pleased to have her here. Uh, I'm from Miami and I've known her since I was a kid, so this is a real honor. Um, with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Chairman Emeritus of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, Congresswoman Ileana ross Leighton. Felicidades, Your Honor. And joining her on stage to lead the conversation is CNN anchor, Ana Cabrera. Ana, as you all know, hosts the weekend primetime edition of CNN Newsroom. Ana, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you, Anna. It is a thrill to be here with you. Well, I'm so glad to be here with you. Thank you. you and I see a few a, of the I mean, uh, Latinas to watch woman. in the audience. I saw that edition already. <laughs> Felicidades. All right, we're going to dive in because we really Let's don't do have it. much time. And I know that you are a busy woman. You know, we, I, I want to get kind of the elephant in the room out of the air first. And, and first, just. I know I've gained just, weight, but come no. on. Gosh. <laughs> kind of harsh to start that way. <laughs> no, you know, on a serious note, this event, I wondered, is it going to go on tomorrow after what happened yesterday with your colleague, our Representative Scalise? And I first just want to say hearts and prayers are positive healing energy is there with his family and with well, your colleagues. You. Steve and is a, a phenomenal person. And thank you, Anna, for the, the prayers and the thoughts and and please send good vibes, not only to Steve, yeah. our, our majority whip, but also to the others uh, who are injured. One is also still in critical condition, but the show must go on. It's important to always send a, a message that bad guys cannot stop our daily life. And just like Ariana Grande went back to Manchester, had that benefit concert. So we will be having the baseball game and our lives must go on. We will not let evil destroy us. Well said. Good. 
How is he doing? Do you have an update for uh, us? You know, he's, he's in critical condition, so, but he's made it through the first critical day, and that's a very good sign. That's what the doctors say. We can get through tonight. He said about last night, things are gonna be a lot better. So, um, you know, that, that, that's yeah. all I'll say. And just uh, uh, thank you to the Capitol Police. Thank you to all of these wonderful heroes who really sacrificed so that it wasn't uh, a, a more difficult situation. And I'm on the uh, congressional uh, softball team. I was the first woman on that baseball you team. You go, girl. But, uh, <laughs> My, my skills have not improved, but uh, we play next week, and I hope that you come out to cheer us on, just like you're going to come out today for the baseball game. Come to the congressional bipartisan uh, team. We, uh, it's the women versus the media. <laughs> so we need, uh, Anna is not on the team, but maybe next it's year. It's a good thing I'm not okay. on the team. I would not <laughs> represent well. I can be the biggest cheerleader, though. You know, uh, a lot of people are here because they want to know about how you ended up where you are. You're, you're now getting ready for Act Two. You'll be retiring this year, but you've broken so much ground in your career as a congresswoman. And I'm curious to learn more about your journey and you know how you ended up in these shoes. Just, just to get it out there, she is the first Hispanic woman ever to serve in Congress. That's huge. I, and the I had first, no idea until I got there. The first Cuban-American yeah. yes. to serve on Congress, the first woman to chair a standing committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee. You've been in elected office representing the nation and, and representing Florida since 1989. So yeah, and then, and then 82 with a state legislature. As a state legislator, exactly. Before you were born, before no, any of well, you were born, I was nice. already in that's office. Nice to say that. Um, but I'm curious, being a woman and being Latina, have you faced unique challenges because of that? I would say that everyone here who is from a whatever minority group you would have to say yes to that question. I'm not saying that uh, we faced discrimination tougher than, than other people. No, some people have really had it tough. Jennifer, is that you? Yeah. Jennifer is our congresswoman from Puerto Rico. And they just had an amazing, what are you doing lurking in the shadows there, woman? Felicidades. What types and of challenges have you faced? So, How do you overcome those? You know. I think in some ways you try to get those challenges and, and turn them into positives. You kind of stand out and people are looking at you and they think, uh, you know, what is she all about? And, and you just prove them wrong. And it's not that you want to blend in. You want to stand out, but you want to let them know you're just as competent, you're just as smart, you're just as worthy of that position, and that you didn't get it because you're a woman or because you're Hispanic. You want it because of your issues and your passion for what you do, and you and by golly, you earned it just as they did. And I think that's the way that you, you're gonna make it, no matter if you're a, a working in a, in a factory or in a bank or, or uh, working as a CEO of a company or, or being a member of Congress from Puerto Rico or Florida. And I'm looking at the iPad here because if you do have specific questions, feel free to send those in and I'll try to, to work some of those in throughout our discussion. There will be a five minute Q&A uh, in which you can also voice your questions on the, the microphone. So keep thinking about those as we continue our discussion. Um, you have such a positive attitude. You talked about passion and it shines through clearly after all this time. It I seems love like what I do. It seems like you're not jaded. How is that? No, I really, I, I wake up happy. I go to sleep happy. And uh, you, have, you have that choice. Sometimes life throws at you some, some bad pitches and, and there's no denying. I mean, we can get terribly sick and we, and, or you're living in poverty or you know, you're part of the working poor. There are some tough situations. But for, and I don't know how people in those difficult situations make it through. They're the ones that you have to say, wow, you know, you have this spirit. Uh, but you have to learn to be compassionate uh, empathetic toward other people. Everyone that you look at and you talk to, you don't know what's going on inside of that person's life. And you may think that person is just like you. You don't know what, what obstacle she has overcome to be here. And so I love what I do because I get to meet people from all walks of life. And I'm just a, a happy fool. I love what I do. Get, listen to this job. You get to meet different people today, look at you, 
you're wonderful and I'm getting to meet you. Uh, then I go vote. And I was born in Cuba. I came here sin, sin saber ni una palabra de inglés. And I get to vote on these important wow. issues. And then, and then I get to have a, a wonderful family when I get home. It's just, I have a blessed life. And, and every one of you can have a blessed life, no matter how difficult your circumstances. And, and not that you can will your way out of poverty or disease, but you know, your attitude matters so much. Your attitude and, and, and how you view your circumstance, you can control how you feel about that. I wonder what mistakes you've learned from over the years. You know, I always say I learn more from my failures than my successes in terms of how we grow as people. And if you were to offer kind of life's lessons, career lessons to the folks who are here and who may be wanting to pursue a career in politics and public service as yourself, what mistakes have you overcome and have learned from that you can pass along? That's a good along? question. And you know, I was, we were speaking before we came on, and she's got two children. One of them is 18 months old, just a little baby. And mm -hmm. all of us, no matter where, what you're doing, we have this balance that we're trying to find that, that, that magic formula. And I'll, I always still struggle with it. And I, look, I think back about other things that I could have done differently. Maybe I could have you know, spent more time here or spent more time there, but we do the best we can. You can't berate yourself and say, oh man, I really blew it. You'd never get over that bad feeling. You gotta live, live for today, live for tomorrow, and build on those mistakes. I've made plenty of them. And- Like what? Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't, I just don't dwell on them, you know, I just, uh, you know, I've, sometimes I, what is your, I vote. What has been your biggest mistake and, and, and if you a, were to look back on your I didn't pay attention votes. to a certain vote and I yeah. voted the diff, a different way than I wanted to. And, and I could obsess on that, but there's going to be another vote tomorrow. And, and just, just get over your mistakes. We're all human and you're mm -hmm. human. T I mean, we all, we all blow it every once in a while. And Gabby knows, where's Gabby? Gabby knows what I'm talking about, about a vote. We won't, we won't go into it, but I meant to vote one way and I voted the other way. Can you I share with us? No, 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 no. Why not? No. You're, you're and retiring. And it wasn't that long ago. No, you're no, no. You're retiring, come Some on. Some things are better left unsaid. No, no, no. <laughs> but I blew it, but whatever. There's another day and another vote and I'm gonna do right. Well, uh, you know, it, it takes Just a lot to us. admit that you have made, I have mistakes, made mistakes on mistakes. voting because your vote is it's very on record, bad. right? And yeah. it, it's out there for people to judge, to yeah. see, but that's also why you're elected to, to do the best you can. People are putting their trust in you. Why did you choose this path of public service? Heck if I know, because I was never in politics. Uh, yesterday I met with a group of uh, youth commissioners they're, they get elected countywide. They're, they're, they're still in high school. And I said, gee, when I was your age, I was doing everything but that. I was not in student government. I was not involved. Uh, I was just, you know, I had hardworking parents. We worked in my parents' uh, forwarding business. And I grew up in a, in a house where we talked about freedom and opportunity. I, I lost my homeland to communism. So we talked about human rights and democracy. And we talked about the value of work. My parents were great role models. I always wanted to be a teacher, and that's what I became. I never would have thought, never, 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 that I had a, a, an opportunity in politics. It wasn't even an option. I mean, it just didn't. That's why I think role models are so important. And what you do in your life, you're a role model for somebody else. You don't have to be a member of Congress to be a role model. Who is All your you. biggest role model? Well, when I first got to Congress, uh, a gentleman, you don't, you don't even know his name, Dante Fassell was a congressman from the Miami area, and he was such a humble guy, and here he was the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and, uh, and he was just a regular guy, and he took me under his wing, and he, and he showed me how Congress works and how you can make your family work with, with, with this job, and uh, to me, he was a mentor. They weren't very many uh, women in politics mm -hmm. then. And now there are a whole lot, not as many as we'd like, because we want you and you and you and you and you to run. And, I, and you're going to win because you're going to have determination and you're going to know the issues. But I, I didn't really have a female role model 
there, there weren't that many of us. Yeah. And certainly well, no Latinas. Let, let me ask you about that, because right now, you mentioned there are a lot, but at the same time, it's not enough. I mean, right now, you look at the congressional makeup, yeah. and out of 535 members of Congress, both House and Senate, only 104 women in Congress right now, about 20%, not quite. 38 are women of color, only 10 are Latinas. Why is that? Why do you think uh, there isn't more diversity right now it in is, Congress? It, you're right. We Congress, you take a snapshot, it is not representative of this audience or any, of course, we're a little bit slanted here, but uh, it's not representative of any kind of audience. We don't represent America. We need more diversity. And I think that the, the, more dif the most difficult part, Anna, is that uh, is fundraising, the cost of campaigns. People hear about it and they, and they read about, you know, so-and-so so got into trouble and they think that politics is dirty, mm -hmm. politics is not for me. And, uh, and, and we're not great role models, that's number one. We're not pro projecting a very positive uh, picture for, uh, 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 for Americans about politicians. Look at all the fighting and we can't even pass yeah. a budget. We're just not, we're not doing it right, so the fault lies in us, first of all. And secondly, you know how, how hard it is to, to raise money and people think, oh, I'm not gonna get into that, to then what? Serve and, and just be nasty and bitter toward each other. Right. So we need to clean up our own act so that we can have quality people like all of you running for office. Politics has become yes. so polarizing. It seems like bipartisanship is a bad word. And yet, you are somebody who has been respected and recognized for reaching across the aisle, for not always towing the party line on your votes. And I'm wondering, you know, as you're reflecting back, one, why aren't more of your colleagues like yourself? And how do you get bipartisanship back into legislating? You are so right. When I first got here, remember this is 28 years ago, it'll be 29 by the time I retire. This was so different. What you have grown up with, because you're all young folks, uh, this is not the way it used to be. This is not, this is not the normal way of, of, uh, of doing the, the country's business. Um, it is now a gotcha game. And every, every election cycle can be a power a shift. And so the stakes are very high. And that's why you have these gotcha bills and these gotcha votes and these gotcha interviews from CNN. No, we, <laughs> not fake news, not fake news. And the media is the, our, our friend. Mark so, those words. Yes, I, I do not have that attitude. But very few, uh, very few people have that kind of bipartisan attitude. You're so right. When you compromise, you give in a little, the other person gives in a little, and you work out a deal. Oh my goodness, that, that's a bad word. Compromise is the new four-letter word, and, uh, and it's, really, it's really tough. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer knows, you know, at the committees, it's, it's dog eat dog. How do you change that, though, given the current political climate? For some members, their districts are so overwhelmingly Republican or so overwhelmingly Democrat that they don't come from a base where you have to make compromise. And if you make a compromise, you're looked upon as weak. If you stick to your guns, you mean you're, you're, you've got principles? No, you're, you're so obstinate and stubborn, we can't get government to function. Government has got to be, has got to be a compromise. It is not a problem, and I don't think with the makeup of, of these districts, and I, I really don't have a rosy outlook that it's going to change. Hmm. Because every election could shift the power of who controls Congress. This next election, pivotal. And it, it, it's only, we're only talking about, let me, let's say 30 seats, no more than that. And people think, this seat is vulnerable, and, and, and that's how you feel about every vote. That's why I won't even tell you what that vote was, forget it. <laughs> I'm, and I'm not even running again. But, but yeah, I mean, yeah, why, but, why, I exactly though, but why is it so hard to yeah. admit that then when you feel like you have a vote you regret? Why can't well, you say it out loud? I don't think people like to hear that you make mistakes. I mean, you want people to be, you want members of Congress to be human, and at the same time, you're thinking, gosh, how could she have voted in an incorrect way? You kind of don't want to hear it. 
you, you want to know that we're human, but not too human. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of expectations yeah. from every, everybody's, uh, when you, where you work, you don't want to admit very much that you made a mistake, right? I mean, it may humanize you, but you may get you fired too. So there's a, there's a, a fine line there. I'm still trying to surf my way through this job. Yeah. I learn every day. Can I ask you about the, the gender pay gap? Because it seems like this has become a partisan issue. And when you look at, you know, Forbes just released its top 100 celebrities and, and the incomes. And when you look at their list, women compromise just, just comprise just 16% of that group. So obviously that reflects a gender pay gap ac across industries. Yeah. And we're alone. talking about the elite now, you do, know, you, do you support, and, and they do, have you, a do you gap. believe that women should be making equal pay? Yes, but men? I believe, I don't think that that's something that you can legislate. We wish that we could. Um, you know, I think that you, you need to raise the consciousness of, of people to say, how could you pay a woman less than you pay a man? And I believe that you should sue that company. I believe you bring them to court. I believe you file complaints in the Human Resources Department. Do everything you can. Passing a law like a mat, we want to, we want to believe that there's a magic solution. Everyone will be paid, you know, the, mm -hmm. we want that to happen. But in reality, the way that the workplace functions, that's just not gonna happen. You're never gonna be able to do that. But you can sue the heck out of those, country, out of those companies, and we should. We need to be more active. We need to, be, uh, we need to, to take it to, uh, um, to the courts. I think that's where the solution is. I don't think that the solution for the gender gap is ever going to be in the political realm. Okay. Um, I think it's going to be in the courts. We have and about, that's where you, we have you about really shame them. Five minutes left for this panel. So if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll get a mic over to you. I'm going to follow up with a quick question about Cuba because that's where you're from. Yeah. You came here as an eight year old from Cuba. And, and, and you have been a vocal opponent to the Castro regime, so much so that you were nicknamed by Fidel Castro the big bad wolf. La Loba Feroz. That's I love right. it. La Loba I put Feroz. it on my license plate. But then I, but then I noticed, <laughs> oh no, people know that who you who you are, then you can't you have to be a super good driver and sometimes uh, whatever. So you, you, I you took don't want to stand so out. So six much months that way, later, right? Esa Chapa, la now la has we we are Hi, we are expecting a, an announcement of some sort tomorrow, tomorrow from this administration on the Cuba policy. Expected that this president will roll back the softening that we That's saw under right. President Obama. Now, did he consult with you? Did President well, Trump ask what you Mario, did? Mario, I, what I, you I have not do? met President Trump. I don't work with him. But Mario diaz balart has been our point man uh, on Cuba issues. You know, you have to specialize in certain issues. You can't do everything so some people are known as the healthcare person or or the labor rights or and Mario for us has been that point person he's been negotiating uh, with the White House the president is going to fly down on Air Force One tomorrow go to the Manuel Artime Center in Little Havana and and explain uh, what his executive order is and it's all in the implementation and it basically is going to be uh, you can't do business with any entity that has ties to the to the Cuban military, and that's what, what you're uh, hearing. And is going that's to what, be the yeah. So, and what we want is policy. freedom, democracy, anything that helps the people of Cuba and doesn't help the regime, because the regime gets money, they use it to beat up on dissidents. Las damas de blanco, you talk about role models. These are ladies who dress in white. You've probably heard of them. They have a flower in their hand, and they march peacefully to church every Sunday and for that with a photo of their loved one who's a political prisoner in jail and the state police comes in Cuba mm. and they beat them and uh, it is unbelievable what's happening to them and uh, those are some incredible role models I mean there are some incredible women in the world who really have it tough and they're standing up for their principles. I have it easy, so it's not a problem for me. Let's get a, a question or two from the audience if we have them. I have more questions for her if you if you don't. Oh have come them. on, but if you come have on, it, raise come your on. hand, big and hot, loud, right, up in front. Quick, quick, come quick, bring the yeah. mic. Okay. Uh, my name is Cristela, uh, and I had a question for you. You talked about compromise and yes, and bipartisanship. To what point? Um, at either party, since you uh, are and are, do you compromise? Like, wh where does the compromise line? I know end? what you mean. Values versus, as a queer woman of color, 
I yeah. would never be able to. You can't compromise <laughs> on basic values like that. I'm not talking about that kind of compromise. You know, when it comes to human rights, um, fairness, equality, there's, there's no compromise on that. I was talking about the budget. You know, what a, what so current you issues are so when, right. when we look at health care, when we look when at we look core at values, at, uh, there's immigration, no, you can't compromise. Taxes, the, the current issues that are out there right now, do you see compromise on any of these? That's, what, that's where we need compromise. We need to come together as a nation and say, we've got to keep the government open. We should not say the goal is a government shutdown. We have members of Congress who are actually advocating uh, government shutdown. No, that's not the solution. That's the problem. We need to come together, compromise on tax reform, on the budget, all of those issues, health care that, that you talked about. Where are you willing to not compromise? If you were values. to lead the way, where would you compromise on the issue of immigration? Well, that for me and for Lucille, and you'll hear from her, I'm a refugee, I'm an immigrant. This country opened its arms to me. How, how comfy, right, for me to say, oh, I'm here, you can't come in, and those of you who are here, poo on you. No, 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 we need to be fair, we need to have a good immigration system that treats the people who are already here in a humane manner, and, and then uh, put a system in place where we're able to, uh, uh, to really have uh, border security. And whether you're from California or whether you're from Florida, wherever, we all know people who are not here legally. They don't have their papers, but they love this country and they pay taxes and they're good people. What do we, what do we earn as a nation when we separate should they have a path fathers to, to children. legal status? Uh, legal people? status, the citizenship, of course they should. That's what, we, that's, that's what we should do as a nation. How we get there has been very difficult. Right. But, uh, but we need to, that's where you start to do a little bit of you give up this and you give up that. And it may not be the best. It may not be the best, but it's getting to the place where people can live here without fear of deportation and uh, without... Uh, separating uh, mothers from their children. That just pains me. We have me. time for one or more Or dreamers. Question. When we deport dreamers, that's crazy. Hi, here, right here. My name is Mauricio Ascuñan. I'm from the Federal Reserve. I'm the chair of the Hispanic Employee Committee. So Hi, first of all, thank you so much for letting me be here in the Latinos, uh, Latina Leader Summit. <laughs> no. So we my, are all my, my question for you is, uh, I understand that society needs to understand the value of diversity and also the value that Latinos in general can provide. Yes. But what will be your advice for us, for the Latinos? What type of skills, what type of experience, what type of knowledge we need to still need to increase in order to get, get more great opportunities? Great question, mm -hmm. right? Wow. What a great question. Uh, I mean, your, yours were great, too. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, by participating in forums like this, it's so important to, to network, to help each other. And maybe you know of a job that's opened up in the Federal Reserve, and you can tell somebody about it, and you help somebody. Never be afraid to help somebody else. You know, it doesn't take away the, your bright light. It helps others. And uh, like that saying says, it, it lifts all boats. So help each other. Be aware of what's happening. And, and, uh, and don't be afraid to speak out in, in, in meetings and in your job. Sometimes we're very meek and we're very passive. And, and I encourage people to, to speak out more and, and to state what their position is and what their problem at work is. Uh, we've got to be our own best cheerleaders, and we don't do enough of it. We're waiting for others to give us affirmation. We need to be self-affirmative. All right, Congresswoman, thank you so Muchas much. Muchas gracias, Anna, and see her this weekend. Thank you. Thank you. So Bye. Nice have a I'm going to scoot right in front of you. Please do. And good luck in Thank your you second everybody. act. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Retiring, Congresswoman. Thank you, Congresswoman Ross Layton. And what a thrill to hear from you, uh, a fellow Cubana, this morning. Anna, staying on for the next conversation. I would now like to introduce Congresswoman Lucille Roybal Allard, who represents California's 40th Congressional District. 
A familiar face for those of you from Los Angeles, Roy Ball Allard has been a longtime advocate for her district and the broader Latino community. In 1992, she became the first Mexican-American woman elected to Congress. She also happens to be the first Latina to serve on the powerful House Appropriations Committee. Please welcome Congresswoman Lucille Royball Allard. Anna, back to you. Yes. So nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Well, thank you for spending time with us, Congresswoman. First, I, I want to get a little sense of how you got to your position. We know you were elected in 1992, the first Mexican-American woman to serve on Congress. But you had quite a role model uh, in your own family, your father, who served in Congress also for 30 years. Did you always want to be a Congresswoman? No, I never even wanted to get into politics. Um, <laughs> having been... Uh, raised in a political family, I understood firsthand what a difficult job it was and the impact that it had on, on families. And I was brought up to always uh, think about you know, supporting others uh, in office and never thought about myself as being one of those that would seek elected uh, office. In fact, my brother and my sister still think I'm crazy um, because it, it, it's a wonderful uh, job. It's, it's a wonderful experience. You're able to do so much to help your community and to fight for your community. But at the same time, it's a, a tremendous uh, sacrifice for the family because it isn't just the person that gets elected. It's mm -hmm. the entire family that is impacted by, by the uh, election. So but, how did you end up? Well, I actually uh, ran, the first time I ran was for the state uh, assembly. And it was because of, of a Latina who had won another position who uh, called and asked me if I would run in her place. And I, I was shocked because, like I said, I'd never thought about running for elected office. But that's an example of a Latinas helping Latinas mm. and opening doors of opportunity. And when my a friend called to say that she was going to call me to ask me to, to run, I, I actually thought he was kidding. And he told them that he knew me since grammar school would never do it. But timing is everything. Uh, I literally was looking to see what I wanted to do next. My husband had uh, a job, his own business, where he was traveling 48 weeks out of the year. And my kids were in high school you know, looking to go to college. And uh, this opportunity presented, was presented to me. And having the growing up in politics and working in nonprofits and, and, and in the community of my entire uh, adult life up to that point, I had a firsthand knowledge of how you could really make a difference by being in an elected office. And so I decided that I would run for the assembly. And I got to Congress because the voters put in term limits into the state legislature. And this new district was created, congressional district was created. And so I had the choice of being termed out or running for Congress. And I decided that I would run in this new district. Again, opportunity. And you never know when opportunities are going to open up. So you mm -hmm. always have to be prepared to be able to take advantage of those opportunities, because they can just come out of nowhere. And yet, as a Latina, have you faced unique challenges because of your identity as a Latina, do you think? Oh, Especially in the good old boys club, so to speak, a lot of white men in Congress. Right. Oh, absolutely. In fact, you know, Ileana is going to be a tremendous loss. Uh, she's retiring. I don't know if that uh, was mentioned. But when I came to Congress, there was only three Latinas. I was the first Mexican-American, Ileana was the first Cuban-American, and Nidia Velasquez was the first uh, Puerto Rican. And there was only three of us. And in addition to all the, the issues that each and every one of you face every day as women, um, we also had to explain to our Congress colleagues what the difference was between me, Nidia, and Ileana. <laughs> I am not joking. I am not joking. And, and I was shocked when I came to Congress because 
most of, of members of Congress, uh, particularly when my dad got elected in the, um, in the 60s, I was already in my 20s, so I didn't grow up in a congressional family. Um, there were members of Congress had never met another minority other than Afri you know, African Americans that were here in, in, in DC, but had never met a, a, a Mexican American. Um, and I, I was just shocked, absolutely shocked. The, the, when, for them, a, a Mexican was the ambassador from, you know, from Mexico or, or you know, uh, from, from uh, Japan. But they, in some cases, there were members who had never met another minority. That speaks American. volumes. And, and your father was the one who actually came up with this idea to have a Hispanic Congressional Caucus or Congressional Hispanic Caucus. I know you're a member of that caucus right. today. Why do you think it's important to have a Hispanic Congressional Caucus? And what do you see as its role? Okay. Well, the, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, when it was started, there was only, I think, there was three uh, to five Latino members uh, at the time. And because there was so little understanding and knowledge about Latinos at that time that my father, uh, seeing what was happening with you know the Black Caucus existed and how they were able to pull together and and um, and focus on issues that were important specifically to the Latino community, he went to Tip O'Neill, O'Neill, and said he wanted to start the Hispanic Caucus. And because they were so small at the time. Uh, in terms of numbers, Tip O'Neill uh, laughingly or kiddingly said to my dad, well, Ed, OK, you can form the caucus, but where are you going to meet in a telephone booth? That's how few there were hmm. at, at that time. But since then, it has you know, grown. And it is because of the Hispanic caucus that for over the years that I have been there, that the, that the focus and we have pushed on uh, having comprehensive immigration reform. It's because of the Hispanic Caucus that the battles that you see in Congress to protect our immigrant community, uh, it's because of the members of the Hispanic Caucus. Uh, without the Hispanic Caucus, especially in, in the earlier days, those issues would have been ignored. And so I, I can honestly tell you the Hispanic Caucus plays a tremendous role in making sure that our leadership, both Republicans and Democrats, do not overlook the specific needs of our Latino community. But it also is important in terms of our message is that helping to educate our colleagues and the rest of the country that Latino issues are the same as every American issue. We all want the same thing. We want good job, paying jobs. We want to have our children to have a good education. We want to have clean air, clean water. Our issues are, are really, when you think about it, no different than anybody else. But, but what happens very often, they try to separate us, make us feel like, like we're different. And that's where the fear is created in, that, in, our, in our country where it's them, whoever them may be, those who don't support us, and, and us, and that we're adversaries. So part of our role is helping the country to understand that, no, we're all Americans. We all want the same, the same thing. And that is a huge challenge, especially now in today's environment. <laughs> Democrats have been criticized for taking the Latino vote for granted. Where do you see your party falling short in terms of the outreach? I think to, to some degree uh, that, that is true. And, and, and I think you have to separate it out. You, you can't put it all into um, every single area and every single district. Because part of the challenge that we have as Latinos is to help our Latino uh, constituents to understand the value and the importance of civic engagement. Because very often, for example, what I'm told when I go out and talk to my constituents is about the importance of civic engagement. It's, you know, para que? Uh, I've got two and three jobs. 
I'm too, I'm, I'm too busy, my kids have to work, I can't afford to send them to college, all the things that I'm sure not only that you have heard, but you, many of you are experiencing yourself. So part of it is helping to educate our community about the connection between what we do, for example, 3,000 miles away from California and how that impacts their everyday life. That is the decisions that elected officials make that determine minimum wage, that determine health care, that determine how much money goes to education, that determines you know, their ability to, to, uh, to buy a house. And once our community, members of our community, start to understand and realize that connection, that in reality they can't afford not to be involved and to elect people who are going to represent our interests the light goes on, and, and I've seen it in several uh, areas in my own district. They become activists, and they organize, and they have been able to stop the building of a prison in East Los Angeles. They have been able to stop the building of a hazardous waste incinerator right in the center of, of my, my district. They have been able to fight the school district, and who had in their area for 30 years, the kids were still in bungalows, and now they have brand new schools, which the community itself told them where they wanted to build them and what they wanted to look like. So there is power in our community, but our community has to understand and believe that they have that power, because once they do, they're unstoppable. Now, when it comes to your role in Congress, you are a leader, you are on the House Appropriations Committee, a uh, ranking member, first Latina to serve as a chair or ranking member uh, on a, in a committee like that. Um, do you feel like you have a role to try to bridge the divide, this um, very partisan divide that has gotten deeper, it seems, and deeper? When you look at the, the current set of issues that are out there and the, the administration's agenda, what do you hope to accomplish under this current administration as a Democrat, as a minority in Congress, a minority party in Congress? Where are the issues that you think will see the nation get something done? That is a really difficult question. <laughs> um, right now, a lot of what we're doing is, is really trying to prevent the worst of things from happening. If you look at uh, the, the president's budget and the cuts that he has uh, made to programs that are important to our communities, whether it's in education, uh, the uh, training uh, for the, in the workforce, whether it has to do with health care, I mean, it's, a lot of it is right now is trying to prevent that from happening. A lot what you don't see is a lot of the work that many of us do behind the scenes to, to make that happen. And I can just use the, the 2017 budget for uh, example, or, or appropriations mm -hmm. that was passed. Some of the things that were proposed and that were being pushed would have been far worse for our immigrant community. But because of the ability of some to work behind the scenes and to work with our Republican colleagues to find some common ground to be able to make it less onerous. And I'm saying less, because it's not the bill that I would have written if, if or the Democrats would have written. But that's about had, compromise, yes. right? Yes. And so we were able to eliminate a lot of the extremely negative things that were in that bill pertaining to uh, education, health care, uh, immigration. Now, 2018 is going to be a whole different story based on, on what we're seeing today. Today, we're having a markup uh, in um, military construction. We have no budget. And we have no idea what the allocations are for the other 11 bills. This is in military construction. We know that they have added uh, millions of dollars more to that, but where are they taking it out of? If history is any indication, every time more money goes into defense, 
military construction and these other, and Homeland Security, in which I am the ranking member, it usually comes out of labor age, which is healthcare, education, uh, you know, all the, all the programs that are important to, to our community. So that's where the fight's gonna be. And, and I just wanna say one thing, because I, I think it's important that the, the public doesn't confuse the, the debates that we have and the disagreements that we have on policy with uh, the, the, the contentiousness that, that is out there that has ended up in the tragedy that, mm -hmm. that we witnessed yesterday. There is a difference. One of the concerns that I have is that you know, we were united, we held hands, we, we, we cr crossed the aisle to, you know, to, to show our support uh, and, and to let the public know that, as our speaker said, we are all Americans. If it happens to one, it happens to all of us. But we're gonna go into a debate, even in, the, I have a markup today, as I said, and we're going to disagree with the process of what's taking place. No budget, what's happening to labor age, all these things. Don't, I, I'm, my concern is that the public's gonna say, oh my God, now they're back to fighting again. There is a difference. How do, what, how do you see that difference? And do, does what happened yesterday give you more fuel to try to reach across the aisle? Well, the, the difference is debating policy versus attacking each other or, or the parties. My hope is that we will be able to find some common, you know, some, some common ground as we move forward. That remains to be seen. I know that on both sides of the aisle, there really is an effort to try and work together. But, and that's happening even before the tragedy of yesterday. Yeah. That is happening today, but that's not what you hear about. And I, and I, I happen to- Is it to, fair to call the Democratic Party the party of obstructionists like we hear from the current administration? It is not. Because what they're saying about being obstructionists is us opposing the budget and the cuts to education, what they're trying to do with, with the raids and the rounding up of immigrants in the, in, in the um, uh, interior of our country. We're going to oppose that. And if they want to call that obstruction, then you know, so be it. But that's our responsibility, is to fight for the things that are important to our community. And this is why I'm saying, I hope the public doesn't confuse the two the two things between what caused yesterday's tragedy, the demonizing of individual members of Congress and parties, and our obligation to fight for the, the values and the things that we believe in on behalf of our constituents. There is a difference. If you have questions, please raise your hand. If we could get a microphone to the woman who's raising her hand, we've got questions. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name's Jennifer. I'm also a Mexican-American from California. I had no idea that you were the first Mexican-American in Congress. That's sad, almost, and I think part of my question. Um, I think we're talking a lot about you know the first generation, second generations of Latinos here, but I'm thinking a lot about our families and how democracy for a lot of our immigrant families has failed them. So I think part of the discussion and how we engage our Latino community is the lack of civics in, in understanding how our process works. How can the party do better at that? How can we do better at that with our, our families? Because I know like within my family, it's very difficult for them to understand that I'd want to pursue and continue in politics and public service. It scares them. Um, so I think, yeah, I'd like to know how we can better civics in our Latino community. Well, again, I think it's, it has to do with starting with you and helping to uh, educate your own families about that connection between what elected officials do and how it impacts their everyday life, how it's important to their quality of life, to the, the lives of their grandchildren. And I, I think that's the starting point, is to edu educate and help your own family to, to understand that. I was very fortunate in, in the sense that I grew up in that atmosphere. Um, I had my first memory, I, and I asked my mother about it, because 
it was about this little girl standing on a corner passing out leaflets. And I asked my mother, I have this memory. What was this? And she says, that was me standing with her in Boyle Heights. And she was passing out leaflets of, to reelect President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm. I'm dating myself here, right? <laughs> um, but uh, so I, I grew up in a family that that modeled. So there needs to be that exposure. Yeah, absolutely, that exposure. And, and part of it is when elected officials have a, you, you know, an open house or a community event, encourage them, go with them, and have them meet your elected official so, to try and demystify the, the, the office and, and just let them know that like, we're human like everybody else. We have the same issues, the same problems. We fight with our husbands or our wives uh, and our kids. You know, we have all the same issues. We just happen to be in, in, in this position. And once you, you demystify it, and also to help people to understand that elected officials work for them, that it is their vote that hires us, and it is their vote for somebody else that can fire us. It is your taxes that pay our salaries. And that you and, and your families have every right to contact your elected officials to hold us accountable, because you actually are our employers. And when they okay. understand that, that they have that right, and you dis demystify the process, again, lights go on, and uh, it's just a wonderful thing to, to see. We are Pretty much out of time, but I want to make sure we get at least one more question. Hello, Congresswoman. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to take the time to thank the organizers of today's event. It's always so empowering to be surrounded by so many wonderful Latinas. So thank you so much. Um, specifically, I would like to thank you for being a first. I had the privilege of working for Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez. And people like you give people like me hope and faith, because you forged a path for us. And it's so important for us to be able to see people that look like us in these positions of power. That being said, um, with knowing what you know now um, and being in this new interesting political climate, what advice would you give your younger self, specifically in your late 20s, early 30s? <laughs> My younger self, thank, you know, thank you for more that. specific. Yes, for that. Um, and just with your experiences and everything, and kind of how I feel as though you have to be ready to fight now more than ever. So, knowing all of that, what advice would you have for yourself at? that age range and for the women here today? Not to be so, so scared. Don't let being afraid uh, keep you from pushing forward. Because that was something I always struggled. I was the first in my family to graduate from college. Um, and when I went to college, there was just a handful of minorities there. This was Cal State LA. I don't know if any of you, are, you know, right now is a large mm. Latino you know, population there. But we were made to feel unwelcome. And, you know, pushing through that and not letting others try and define you. Because you're constantly having to, to struggle with that little voice that sometimes takes in all that the negativity that, that we hear and, and that, and that self-doubt. And one of the things that I, I was fortunate, and I think that helped me, was not only my father and my mother modeling for me the fighting of what was out there, because when he became the first Latino elected to the LA City Council, there was threats on his life, on my mother's life, threats, kidnapping. When going to grammar school, we used to have safe houses where if anyone tried to grab us, we were told, you know, this is where we were uh, supposed to, to run. And, and, and also, I was very, very fortunate because when my father, after he got a, he lost the first time for city council, then won the second time uh, through a community organizing that was taught which became, uh, after he got elected, that group, the community came together realizing their power, and they formed the community service organization, the CSO, which is where, and I was fortunate to meet as a little girl, met uh, Cesar Chavez and, and Dolores Huerta. 
They trained in Boyle Heights, the community organizing that we, they learned in, uh, in Boyle Heights with the CSO and then went on to organize the farm workers. So I was fortunate to have a lot of this modeling for me. You are all models. You may not feel that, but each and every one of you are models. You have come to the point that you are at with the same kinds of prejudice, the same struggles, the same uh, issues that I and everybody else. I'm here because of what others did before me. I didn't just you know, get here on, on my own because I'm Lucille Roybal Ellard. There were others who laid that foundation for me to be here, the same with you know, uh, uh, others. You right now are also laying that foundation. You are, you are building on the foundation that was laid for you. And you all have power. You need to realize that power. And it is scary. I can tell you that. I knew nothing about politics. Mm -hmm. My father was a politician. I wasn't. Just like if your father's you know, a, a surgeon, you don't automatically know how to you know, operate, right? Well, I didn't know anything about politics except as being the daughter of. And when I got to Sacramento as an assemblywoman and I came to Congress, I was scared and I was nervous. Well, Congresswoman, thank you for sharing your courage and your bravery and your story with all of us. I wish we had more time to speak. Okay, thank so you. nice to meet okay. you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Roy Ball Allard. Thank you, Anna. Now it's time for the sponsor perspective portion of this morning's discussion. The next conversation is programmed and presented by our sponsor, PGE. Please join me in welcoming on stage Geisha Williams, President and CEO of PGE Corporation. Earlier this year, Geisha became the first Latina to lead a Fortune 500 company. Moderating. Moderating this conversation will be Maria Cardona, principal at Dewey Square Group and a political commentator on CNN and CNN en Español. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Buenos dias, como están? <laughs> Packed house, awesome. <laughs> it is so thrilling to look out at the audience and see right? Right, these amazing faces. And I uh, just want to underscore something that the Congresswoman said, that you all are role models. You all are leaders. Never forget that. Never forget that power. Speaking of power, <laughs> <laughs> in more ways than one, I am thrilled to be here to moderate this short, but I think we'll, what will be a very impactful chat with Geisha Williams, who, as you all heard, is the first Latina to be elected by a board of directors, actually to a Fortune 200 company. Yes, round of applause, please. Which is both incredible and incredibly sad. I agree. That that, that happened. But I know that you, will, you were the first, but you certainly will not be the last. That's the hope. <laughs> but eyes are on you, like it or not. I'm sure that's something that you have been used to your whole life. And speaking of that, I want to start with a conversation about how you started, literally how you started here in this country. Uh, you came over here from Cuba, yep. five years old. Yep. I'm sure that was an incredibly both impactful, overwhelming, scary, challenging, all of those words, I think, uh, go to describe that. But tell us a little bit how that was for you and how that cemented your thinking and how you were going to achieve goals in your life. Well, it's, uh, first of all, it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, you are the future, by the way. You have to be the next generation of leaders, so never forget that. We're counting on you. Uh, so I was born in Cuba. I came to this country when I was five years old. My parents were political dissidents. And uh, we came to the United States like just about every other type of immigrant that there is, right, with just barely the clothes on our backs. We didn't speak the language. We had no rural connections. And we ended up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Wow. So can you imagine, right, little refugees getting off that plane with just like little bare sweaters in this incredibly Oof. cold climate. But the people were wonderful. The people were warm. It made up for the climate. 
And it was, uh, it was challenging on so many different counts. Uh, for me, entering kindergarten was my first challenge, right? So I didn't speak the language. I was probably scared out of my mind. I have a weird name, Geisha. <laughs> I'm sure that they were saying Geisha or Geisha. My parents called me Hesa. My last name's Jimenez. They were probably saying Jimenez, right? So they're saying Geisha Jimenez. It doesn't sound like Hesa Jimenez, right? <laughs> so I'm just sitting there, and I'm not responsive. I'm just, I'm, I'm afraid. And so the teacher decides that I must need special education, that in fact, I must be deaf, and that I must be mute, because clearly I can't speak. So my parents have to go through this incredible bureaucracy, little refugees who don't know anything, to prove that their daughter didn't have a hearing problem, didn't have a speech problem, that she just didn't speak the language. And so that was my first obstacle. And we overcame it, and, and life was good. <laughs> but you know, I have to tell you, being here with my parents in this country and, and really um, being part of the fabric of this country, which is really the immigrant blood that runs through so much of this nation, is something that I'm very proud of. They taught me the value of hard work and perseverance, perseverance and never giving up. They shared with me the incredibly important value of education and community service. And that's something that I brought with me every step of the way. Terrific, thank you. Throughout your career, and you went into an industry that still to this day is probably male dominated. Um, the engineering fields, STEM fields, are something that a lot more Latinas are getting into, but certainly not enough. Uh, I want to talk to you about the importance of mentors. Yeah. Yes. And um, as, as my experience was, when I was coming up, there weren't a whole lot of other Latinas in positions of being able to mentor. I depended on fantastic men to mentor me. T tell us a little bit about what your experience was. Maria had the same experience for me. So I had the great privilege. It was one of those defining moments in my life, actually, where I had a mentor by the name of Clark Cook. I talk about him all the time. I still, ha I still see him once or twice a year, have lunch with him at least once a year. And uh, he was a high-level person in the company. I had just joined the company. I think I was in my early 20s. And um, he asked me one day, you know, so Geisha, what do you want to do someday? What are your long-term career aspirations? Well, I have to tell you, I'm the first in my family to get a college education. I was an immigrant. My aspirations were really low. They were modest. I thought maybe I could be a supervisor or a manager someday. And so I said something like that. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, no, long-term. I was talking long term, but uh, he said, Geisha, and this is, this is the question that has really fired my, fueled my whole career. He said, Geisha, someone has to run this company someday. Why not you? Why not you? And I, I thought about it, and I thought, well, women, you know, people like me didn't run companies. Certainly there weren't any women, there weren't any Latinas, and there weren't any immigrants. But he said, well, why not you? And I remember him pulling out this organizational chart of our company, showing who was running what department and their backgrounds and educational experiences. And I noticed a couple of things. First, many of them were engineers. And I thought to myself, I'm an engineer. And then the other thing that I noticed is they had really deep experience in operations. And so he said to me, that's what you need. You need to get operation experience. You need to really get a little dirt under your fingernails, is what he said. Yeah. You really need to understand how the business works. He was the reason that I started believing that maybe it could, it could be me. Why not me? And I've taken that credo. That is a personal credo, those three words, why not you or why not me? Even to this day, hey, someone's going to have to lead in clean energy. In, in this country, why not PG&E, why not me? Hey, someone's going to have to figure out how to really tie all these technologies together, why not me? And that would be my message to you. Whatever it is that you want to do in your life, ask yourself why that couldn't be you and really believe it could be you and go for it. Thank you, that's terrific, yes. It couldn't have been easy, no. you coming up in the ranks. And I'm sure, and this happened to me too, people saw a woman, like you said. People not only saw a woman, they saw a Latina woman. I'm sure a lot of men were like, hmm, what's going on here? Tell us just very quickly, and then we'll get to the last question. But I think this is important, because we will all go through this and have all gone through it in some way, shape, or form. What are some of the barriers, and some of them conscious from other folks, some of them unconscious, that you had to go through to sort of say, look, you know, I am here, I have skills, 
And I am, you know, you might have been the boss, you might have been the colleague, you might have been the underling, but you are here to do a job that you are more than qualified to do. We all have barriers. I think the very first barrier that I faced, frankly, in the workforce was the fact that I was young. So first, just being young. Uh, then the fact that I was a woman in a very male-dominated field, the fact that I was Latina, where there really weren't any Latina leaders to really speak of. And I think how I, how I always faced it was, it was going to be the strength of my capabilities, the strength of my work product, the strength of my integrity that was going to define who I was. I was not going to be defined by a label, and I certainly wasn't going to be held back by one. And so as I went through my career, I had more than one encounter where um, someone older, someone not Latino, somebody <laughs> not a woman would say, hey, would you get me a cup of coffee? Oof. And you know what? You can't. Don't, get a, don't go along to get along. That would be my first piece of advice. I like that. Do not. You, from day one, you set the rules. You set the pace. You set what that conversation is going to be like. And you don't have to be a jerk about it. You can use a little humor. I've always used a little humor. And I'd say, no, what happened? Did your arms fall off? Did your legs fall off? Get it yourself. <laughs> don't let people call you honey. Don't let, you, don't let anyone call you sweetheart. Don't let anyone ever call you by anything that's even remotely uh, a little racial or, or ethnic. Don't. You set the standard with your actions. Smile on your face, but you don't put up with it. And I think at the end of the day, it's your work, it's the quality of who you are as a person that's going to determine your, your future. Don't forget that. And don't let anyone hold you down. And certainly don't let yourself hold, your, hold yourself down. Yes, I like that. <laughs> Fantastic pieces of advice. So for the last question, you have daughters. I do. And uh, a lot of people here, I'm sure, can benefit from the advice that you have given and probably will continue to give yeah. your young daughters. You've given us some great pieces of advice so far, but what else would you tell this audience? So I have two beautiful daughters, one that just graduated from college, one that just graduated from high school. And, and the advice I've given them is they've got to find their passion, and they also have to find their voice. And, and really, they go hand in hand. But the other piece of advice that I've given them, and I've given this advice to not just my daughters, but anyone who asks me is, you know, what does it take to succeed? What, what single piece of advice I would provide you is, whatever your field is, whatever that might be, do the tough jobs. Mm -hmm. Do the difficult work. Why? Well, first of all, someone's got to do it. Mm -hmm. Second, most people don't want to do it. And when you do this difficult job, whatever it is, this difficult project, this difficult assignment, lots of things happen. First of all, you get noticed because guess what? It was difficult, and you succeeded, and you accomplished something that maybe was, was not expected. That's the first thing, and, and it's important to get noticed. But more importantly, when you do this tough job, and you succeed, and you nail it, and you will nail it, mm -hmm. what it does for you, the confidence it builds in you is unbelievable. And you take that confidence, that knowledge that you can do it to that next assignment, then you nail that one too. And before you know it, you are unstoppable. You're a force of nature. So, but it starts with courage. And I, and I saw the Congresswoman say yes. something similar about yes. not being afraid. It starts with courage, not being afraid, leaning in and doing the difficult work and doing it well. I guarantee that you're going to get noticed. But more importantly, you're going to feel a tremendous sense of empowerment. Thank you. Thank you, Geisha. It's been a pleasure for me. And I know that you have shown this audience and you have shown the world what Latinas can do. You are the first. You certainly won't be the last. And it's been a thrill to be here having this conversation Thank with you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so Thank much. You all. Thank you, Geisha. Thank you, Maria. As we continue this morning's discussion on building a pipeline of Latina leaders, we will be hearing from trailblazers in business, education, and government. We are looking forward to hearing more about their journeys and how Latina leaders can serve as mentors to those just starting their careers. I am pleased to welcome on stage Alejandra Castillo, former director of the Minority Business Development Agency. She was the first Hispanic American woman to lead the agency since its creation. A practicing attorney for several years, Alejandra has worked in government, nonprofit, and the private sector. Uh, next is Nina Vaca, chairman and CEO of the Pinnacle Group. 
Apart from running her very successful company, Nina is also a passionate advocate for women and entrepreneurs, especially within the Hispanic and minority community, communities. In 2014, the Obama administration appointed Nina a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship. And we have Jenny Korn, Jennifer Korn, special assistant to the president and White House deputy director for the Office of Public Liaison. Prior to the White House, Jennifer was Deputy Political Director and National Director for Hispanic Initiatives at the RNC. And uh, finally, Sarita Brown, President of Excelencia in Education. Her not-for-profit organization <laughs> seeks to accelerate Latino success in higher education. And Erica Gonzalez, reporter and anchor with Washington, D.C.'s local NBC TV affiliate, NBC4, will be leading this conversation. <laughs> Erica, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, buenos dias, como estamos? Yes. This is an exciting day, an exciting panel. Um, lots of questions, and so we wanna try to get to everybody a couple of times, okay? And of course, we're gonna have your questions a little closer to the end, so start thinking of what it, what it is that you really wish that you had the opportunity and that you hope you don't wait any longer to ask somebody and really hear heart to heart what it takes to get through those doors and to really get where you wanna be. So we're gonna start first a um, little bit more broad and then we'll zero in. So I wanna hear, and anybody can either raise their hand or chime in, say, I got this, whatever you'd like. Let's talk specifically about the unique strengths that Latinas bring to the table. Not necessarily what sets us apart, but what are, the, what are, our, what are our strengths? What is it that we bring to the table that makes us uniquely different? Anybody can chime in. I think it's the combination of both culture, language, and the fact that we're women. Um, I, uh, I'm a daddy's girl, so all the men in the room, thank you for raising great women. Uh, but in terms of the premise that women really are able to be very practical, get very visionary, and have really fierce loyalties, I think that's something that women have. Latinas in particular are able to tap into that. I would say that um, there's a little saying that you say, if you tell a man something, you've told one person something. If you tell a woman something, you've told five people. If you tell a Latina, you've told 25 right. people. <laughs> and so we have that ability to bring people together, to really Everybody laughs because you know message. it's true. It's very true <laughs> in my family, to bring people together. And that has helped me definitely in, in my career in making sure that we're really reaching out and bringing as many people together. So Sarita mentioned language uh, being an asset, being a strength that Latinas have. Can we talk a little bit about the strength in having multiple languages and dominating multiple languages? And if you don't have the ability to dominate a second or a third language, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a weakness as a Latina. No, it's never a weakness. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm a big proponent that learning new languages is critical. Whether you love French or Italian, your brain thinks very differently. Right. You know, I think of language as music. You, know, you may like classical music, you may like jazz, but there's a way to figure out the world. And if you don't ha know a language, then learn something new, a code, right? Coding is a language. Math is a language. It's ways for us to expand the way we communicate and that we see the world and analyze it. So I was gonna piggyback on the first question. We are extraordinarily resourceful. We can figure it out. You give us a problem, and within minutes, and I see a lot of heads nodding, we can figure it out. So languages are, are very important, and it's never too late. It's never too late to learn a language. Let me, get, let me kind of change uh, topics here and talk about, and we've talked about some of our strengths, but what are some of the greatest obstacles that are standing in our way that leave us knocking at the door and continuing to knock at the door? Some of the biggest obstacles, quite frankly, not just for Latinas, but for all women, is that you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't see other women prospering, if, you don't, if they are not out there mentoring or lending themselves right. to panels or lending them their leadership or their experiences to bear, women can't see that. In the Latino community, it's even more exasperated because there's so few in corporate America mm -hmm that have risen to the occasion of the C-suite. I was marveled that Geisha was here. I thought it was amazing that she would spend her time mentoring people. But that's one of the biggest obstacles we face is you can't be what you can't see. But I think it's also inspiring for those that are there 
you ladies that are in these positions to talk about them and to express that they're messy. The road there was messy. It's never clean cut, clear cut. It was never easy. And I think that oftentimes, maybe we get to some stages and we wonder, was there a better way that I could have done this? Or does it really look like this? Is it this messy? Um, so I think it's important that you said that. I want to try to ask you all some specific questions based on your backgrounds and your career. Uh, Nina, let me, let me start with you and let me ask you, we spoke a little bit about this backstage and you, you just touched on it a little bit here, but the challenges that Latinas are facing in corporate America and part of the reason why you chose to go a different direction. Yeah, I actually did. I spent uh, two years in corporate America and you know, oftentimes entrepreneurs, if they, they, they don't see a path, they create one for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years. I started my company out of my living room floor. And 20 years later, we're proud to be the fastest growing woman-owned business in America. Oh. That deserves an applause. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Alejandra, let me ask you about the unique strengths that Latina business owners have not just on a local scale, let's talk globally. Sure, and I think uh, Nina alluded to this. When, when we find ourselves in difficult situation, again, we make it happen. Therefore, we start our businesses. But our challenge is not starting the business, it's helping them grow. grow. And that's yeah. where we really need to hone in. And as our economy starts to, well, not starts, continues to change, where you're more innovative, uh, innovation driven and more technologically driven, we really need to look at the business community from the lens of technology. And how do we incorporate that? So I, I love the fact that uh, Latina owned women are the fastest, the fastest growing in number. My concern is how do we help them grow in scale? Because that's where the job creation starts, right? And that's where the sisterhood for entrepreneurs, you know, Nina does a fantastic job mentoring other uh, Latina and women-owned businesses. We need to learn how to leapfrog that learning curve because if we start small, it takes us forever. And I know that you've had a, a, an amazing journey, mm -hmm. but we, how, how wonderful had it been if you had been, been able to shorten that from 20 years to 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where we really need to create this ecosystem to help our, our Latina-owned businesses So let's grow. say, Alejandra, that you mm -hmm. do have this dream, and maybe you're blessed with having a mentor, mm -hmm. somebody like yourself. So you, you've got those boxes checked, and you want to start this business, and you want to take it on a grand scale. How do you connect to get the funding that you need to move this dream along? Sure. Uh, so the access to capital is the number one problem for, for businesses. And let me tell you, there's a lot of capital. So it's not that the, the availability of capital, it's how do we access it. And that's where, you know, Jenny, who is now in the, uh, at the White House, and people who have served in previous administration have been working really hard to make sure that the capital in this country is democratized. So it's not just the people who have always had capital, but those who are seeking it. So you have the SBA, but you also have other alternative capital uh, sources. And technology is, you know, the whole conversation of fintech is something that we need to monitor because that's also going to change the way that banks and lending institutions are actually engaging uh, Latino-owned businesses. Sarita, let me turn to you and ask you about some of the barriers facing Latinas <laughs> in attaining their higher education and moving through and attaining more. There are barriers, but what is exciting today is that there's also a body of knowledge mm -hmm. of how to overcome. And uh, hearing these comments, which are pretty much in the business sector, you can take all of the strategies and apply it to what we might call intellectual entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Because the changes within institutions of higher education, within the educational system, fundamentally are the same. And that the idea of how do you get capital, mm -hmm. so capital is allies. So whether it's in the K-12 system or whether it's in post-secondary, who are the professors, who are the student affairs professionals, how can they tell you what best to do so that not only your course sequence, but also how to get financial aid, how to move forward. All of those things are better mapped today than they've ever been. And the opportunity to be able to use those lessons learned and to go forward is very high. I can't help, though, but seize the moment because also you have great nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. that you can turn to and coincidentally 
Two of them are led by women who happen to be sitting in the front row. Mm -hmm. And so I would ask them to stand up because in terms of what they do, in terms of scholarships for students, leadership and mentoring, they are examples. What I'm doing right now, this is what all of us can do. What are they? Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Now that we've had you stand up, can you please tell us your names and the organizations that you represent, please? Uh -huh. sure. I'm Dominica Lynch, and I'm president of the Congressional Society Institute, and we love. Uh, no, no, no. no. I said that I love you. <laughs> well, you know, my life's work has been working with people the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the reason these ladies do what they do is because they know that they're trailblazers and there's so many more of you following. And so I'm just inspired and thank you so much. Thank you. Marianne. Uh, buenos dias, Marianne uh, Gomez Horta, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. Thank you. May, may, may I just say that um, I am a product of CHCI. Had it not been for CHCI, I would not be in Washington. And I won't disclose what year, but let's just say, <laughs> let's just say that it is these two uh, uh, ladies are doing unbelievable and, uh, things in this town. And that's the sisterhood that we have. When we talk a little bit about educational barriers, can we also talk about, I think, I was fortunate enough to have some good mentors when I was in college. And I knocked on some good doors and got some good answers at school. At home, can we talk about the barriers that we face? Can we be really honest here? Sure. La familia, yeah. mom, dad, the grandparents that are super nervous and scared about you going off to fulfill your dreams, to go away from your home, to leave the family, to abandon everybody, my word. Uh, they're and honest to goodness in our community. Oh, they're very real time. struggles, and they're difficult conversations to have. How did you all address those conversations, and what would be your advice to those sitting here with us today in having to say, I love you, but I'm going to go. Are, are you sure those are your words? Those are my mom's <laughs> really? words. So, um, no, it's, I think it's a very real thing. And 20 years ago, it was uh, even more of a barrier. Right. I think we're getting through, as, as our generations come through, we're getting a little bit away from that. But I remember um, I got a scholarship to Pepperdine University, and you could um, sign up to go to Washington, DC to be an intern. So I signed up, and I got accepted. It was so exciting. And, and my mom was going to let me go. And she was very nervous about it. But my grandmother. It was my abuelita who was like, I can't believe that you're going to let her go all the way across the country. I mean, she made it sound like I was going to Saudi Arabia. You know, it was just like the worst thing. And um, it, it was a barrier to me. And so uh, one of the things I've been doing is I bring as many Latina groups together to talk to them about how to talk to their family and that it's OK Good. to let go and still be close to my family. I mean, my, my family is all still in Los Angeles. And my mom, every, I feel guilty every day that sure. I'm not there. <laughs> but it's one of those things, if you know what you really want to do, you need your family support, and you need to explain to your family, this is what I need to do, and it's to, to help elevate Latinas as a whole. I mean, I'm so proud that, um, you know, I didn't have a mentor uh, growing up. I mean, my dad was my mentor, and but he didn't, he hadn't gone to college. My mom hadn't gone to college, and so, you know, I just knew I was going to college. I didn't know what it was, but I was going when I was five years old, so, um, and then that opened up so many other doors to eventually work uh, in the White House for the second time now, and, uh, you know, it's, what the, but the biggest thing to me is then because I didn't have that the mentor outside in the workforce is for me to be a mentor to other Latinas and I'm so proud to one of our Latinas is here Hannah Castillo who's in the back who's only 26 years old and already our office manager and doing amazing things and we you know just being able to bring more Latinas in and mentor them as they go through their experience and help them in your experiences or oh I'm sorry go ahead Sarita. Just, and I also think that there's a great opportunity for us to bring our loved ones with us mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that we leave them behind. Yes. I mean, the opportunity, mm -hmm. because our numbers are greater, right. to be that bridge and to help our families. Uh, right now, Excelencia has a whole series of Latino grads 2017 and on our social media stuff. And what you see are the abuelita and mama mm -hmm. and papa and all the other family members there. And as somebody who is looking at recruitment, you recruit all of them. I mean, in terms of the economy and what we need in terms of talent, we need talented people. We need right. trained people. And that isn't a specific age group. But for us, who are opening the doors, bring the family with us. Yeah. 
And can I, can I add to that? That's, that's a beautiful statement. You have to bring your family with you. And at times, and I'm going to be very, very blunt, and at times you need a little dis distance. Um, I will confess that at one point I divorced my family. Um, because when you're in Washington, D.C., and I'm just going to speak about Washington, or in any other industry, and you are invested and you're drilling down and you're making it happen, the drama of family at times, they don't understand what you are going through. I ate a lot of cereal when I was <laughs> beginning in this town. But then you create new family. And you know I, I need to recognize um, Milady Guilarte and Jordan Valdez and uh, Federico de Jesus and, uh, um, and so many who are in this audience today. Those are my Washington family. They're the ones I call and I, and, and I see Abigail as well. They're the ones I call and I, and I reflect my family from home is the ones that are closest to my heart, but they don't understand this world. And sometimes it can be very lonely. But you have to protect yourself. And in our communities, mental health is not an issue we talk about. You have to be whole all the time, spiritually, physically, intellectually. And family at times needs to understand that, or you have to get some distance. So I had to be very blunt, because this is a tough town. It's true. It's a tough it's, town. It's very true. Jenny, let me come back to you. Nina, oh, sorry, go ahead. I know, it, but, you know, but do you understand? See, we said one word, family, and everybody has <laughs> something to say about it. I'm like, pick me, pick me. <laughs> go for it. No, I just, I just wanted to comment. I, as, I'm, as I'm listening to my colleagues speak, and I'm, I'm listening to the audience, and I'm watching, I, I go back to your very first question of what do we, what is the uniqueness that we bring? Yeah. And it's so passion. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is the passion that we bring to what we do and the passion to help our families and our community mm -hmm. as evidenced by the many people in this room. I feel like I'm in a family reunion of my own. And so I just, I love, and, I, and when, I'm, when I'm in that ecosystem of Latinas, our community, I always find that the people that spend their time, whether they're from corporate America or entrepreneurship or nonprofits, they're very passionate about mm -hmm. advancing us as a community aside, and that's just really amazing to me. So let me give a four minute warning to when we do audience Q&A, so you can start thinking about what it is that you might want to pose specific questions. We're going to do five minutes of Q&A. Jenny, let me continue with you. Do you think that there is a way to, can you build a pipeline of Latina leaders coming up? I know you mentioned um, the young lady that you work with, 26 mm -hmm. years of age, that is just you know, blowing through barriers. Can you do that in the public, in the private sector? Can you build this pipeline mm -hmm. of strong, you know, capable Latinas that are ready to ready for the job, ready to Absolutely. go? Absolutely. No. It's well, well. First of all, the as everybody knows, Hispanics are the largest growing um, population in the country. Fifty thousand Hispanics turn eighteen years old every month. So we have just this amazing farm team of Latinas who are ready to to go around in every in every industry. And so it is possible. And I, it's possible. I'm already seeing it. I mean, there are all these wonderful nonprofit organizations, all of these that that we work with, and the one thing that I'm able to do over at the White House is to bring in as many Latinas in there as possible to talk about policies, to talk about the concerns that the, the, the um, community has. And um, Nina was able to join us uh, at a round table with Ivanka, Trump, and other Latinas in the workforce uh, to talk about what are the obstacles that we face and how can we bring more in. And so we are trying to um, expand that and bring that word to, to as many people in the community as possible and bring as many Latinas to, to DC, regardless of whether they want to be in, in politics or business or healthcare, IT, what have you. It's about making sure that we're telling people what the opportunities are and then mentoring them. So the possibilities are endless. And now with social technology, social networking, forget it. I mean, I, the young kids in my office are like, um, you didn't have a cell phone? How did you, like, what did you do back then? I mean, the, the information that, that you're open to is so amazing. The, the tools that you have are so great. So I just um, encourage everybody to take advantage of them. And this is one thing uh, somebody has accused me of being. They're like, you're too timid. You're as a, you know, as a Hispanic woman. So what we have to do is not be timid. We have to make sure that we go out there and we do knock on that door. We are important and we can talk to that congresswoman. We can talk to that governor. We can talk to that CEO. And so make sure that you, whatever you want, you go out there and you get it. And you join those networks so that they can help you move along. I think that's the one thing that was missing you know, 20 years ago that is really starting to grow is the networks that are so important. So let's say we do get to that door and we do knock on that door and we are absolutely certain that there is something behind that door 
that we want, and not only that we want, but that we are capable of having, not because it's given, but because it's earned, mm -hmm. that the door doesn't open. Yeah. And you find a window. So what happens? You find a window. Yeah, I mean, okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I mean, Basa, what do you do? Yeah. What do you do then? You you don't take no for no. an answer. I I, I mean uh, the the. Blessing of my life is that I found a cause when I was very young. I was a student activist at the University of Texas at Austin, and I knew that UT, hey, no. <laughs> that UT did not look like the state. Mm -hmm. And I said, this isn't right. Now, I didn't know then what I can now argue from the demographics, from human capital, from the economy. I, I just knew it was wrong. And so I started to pursue that and check it either at each step of the way. That led to a career, which ultimately led to the opportunity that when I had the opportunity to f look at the census data and see that no one was really arguing it in the way we now do, which is it's about human resources. Mm -hmm. A country's most precious resource is its human resource. Education is fundamental to developing that human resource. Latinos are part of this country's future. And how do you approach that? Tactically. So arguing that at the time, we started a nonprofit organization because we couldn't grow it any other place. And we made the case to those who could support. And of course, we always had to prove that what we were doing was useful. I mean, they weren't going to do it just because we were smiling. Or, sure. But you don't let up. You don't let up. You just pursue it. And you have to be practical. You have to pay your bills. And you have to make sure that you know, life and home is taken care of. But if there's something that you know needs to change, and you're in a position to do it, then you pursue it. I mean, you use the passion that we have. And you make it happen. And you look for people who believe in the same cause. And I think there may be also, when we talk maybe about some, while we're passionate, I think some may be timid. And how aggressive is enough mm -hmm. to say, I want to go after what it is that I know that I'm capable of and, and you know what, what I'm worth. And at other times, how do you say, OK, I know that this isn't going to be the place that's going to grow me, that's going to invest in me, and that's going to mentor me? You know, tactically finding that. So how do you, when do you read those waters and say, yes, I'm going to keep pushing. I will get here someday. Or when do you say, you know what, this just may not be the place for me. <laughs> that sometimes comes with time and age, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Nina go first. <laughs> no, I said that the, the absolute correct answer to that is it depends. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on so many different factors. And you have to be able, you know, in life, I always tell people, surround yourself by people that truly want to see you succeed. I posted something yesterday, and I got a kick out of it because it's so true. Girls compete with each other. Women empower each other. And you have to figure out, thank you. You have to figure out the difference. Yeah. A long time I learned in life, there's two kinds of women, those who will help you and those who will not. It, there's no, it, it's those that will help you and those who are not. So you have, to be, you have to be good at realizing which one am I dealing with. And just, I mean, go for the ones that you know want to empower you, want to help you, and do the same. Because your reputation will follow you if you are not being genuine, if you are not doing those things. But figuring out those two and then spending time, it's that old adage that I hear every time. You know, dime quien son tus amigos y te diré quien eres. Right, everybody you know. knows that adage. I mean, my father told me that when I was 17, and today I'm still saying this. And I can't say it enough. Ladies, you know, surround yourself by people that truly want to see you succeed um, and stick to them like glue. Se me fue el tiempo. We have very quickly. I want to try to get to two questions. Let's see very quickly. Yes, ma'am, right here in the front or second row. Yes. Go ahead. Stand up. Let me let's hear you. Hi. My name is Alma Molina. Uh, my question is around the gender pay gap. And how can we better own our worth, get better at asking for what we deserve, and get more comfortable talking about accumulating long-term wealth within the community? Can we narrow that down into like 30 <laughs> seconds? <laughs> Anybody. So, so wealth creation, it's a, a passion of mine. It's, it's not enough to have a business and just kind of pay the bills. No, we need to have change our, our narrative. 
and our narrative from a poverty narrative to a narrative of abundance. Now, it's not, gonna, it's not a magic wand. It doesn't happen overnight. But when you have people like Anina Vaca who's, who's doing it, as you said before, you have to see it to, to, to be it. Um, but we also need to be more strategic in our conversation. In this country, we live in a capitalistic society. It is capital that moves. So whether it's pulling our money and creating a business and helping others, whether it's scaling it, we need to talk about scale, whether it's being in, in an industry that is beyond just the, the, the grocery store, we need to start thinking about that. And I would be happy to, to connect with you. That's the other thing, let's connect. Mm -hmm. If you want a friend for life, ask for a favor. As Latinos, we don't know how to ask for help. So mm -hmm. I am That's encouraging you, true. bombard us. Don't take it personal if we don't answer immediately but we will eventually connect with you. That's I will, so good. I think it's really important though, it took me 10 years to ask for yeah. a raise. Like it, it was very hard, like, oh, I don't wanna do that, I don't wanna ask for that raise. So you just have to, you know, get the cajones to do that. Um, <laughs> and, but the thing, be prepared, what is your worth, what you bring to the company, what have you seen, you know, be knowledgeable about what other people are doing and what you are doing and your value added to the company and not because you're a woman, and not because of this, because I bring this to the company and this is what I ask and you need to be bold about it and you have to practice it a couple times maybe in the mirror before you go into your boss to ask because it is, it's some of us just don't naturally can do that but that's the one knock on us, right? Men can just go in there and go, I'm worth this and I want you to pay me otherwise I'm gonna walk out of there. We're sort of afraid of, of that, of doing that. We need to put it on the table, but we need to be prepared and say this is what our worth is. Let's do another question from the audience. Yes, oh. ma'am. Hi. Hi, Alejandra. Hi. Hello. Um, so a common theme of today has been believing you can be something that does not yet exist, and that is not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. I believe you guys all became what did not exist. Um, can you talk about a moment when you failed on that journey, a specific moment, experience, and what you did uh, to pick yourself back up. I remember very well when we were starting Excelencia, the commitment that we received from a significant funder uh, fell through. Um, uh, the person had made a commitment but ultimately wasn't in a position to activate it. And there was the need for sincere gut check. Because the rational part is, if you don't have the funding, then you really shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. And I had come here thinking I was, at some point, going to go home to Texas. This was a good time with my tail between my legs to go home. And, you know. and I said, you know, I don't do well with what ifs. I accept when I can't change something. But if, it's, if I'm going to wonder for a really long time. So I thought, how long could I reasonably invest myself, my own resources. I had just adopted my daughter as a single mom. And I said, oh. I have to give this all that I think is reasonable, and then it's finite. So I said, it'll be one year. If in one year we can raise the resources to make the organization fly, then not only we will have succeeded, but we'll have the feedback from the market. And if, and if the market tells us no, it might be a really good idea, but we'll go home. And in that first year, we raised the resources. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that I knew it was going to work, but what I knew was that I would be at peace yes. with that outcome. Important. And then I could redirect and spend my energy someplace else. Mm -hmm. Because the, the things that we want to do, there are probably a thousand ways to get them done. Right. There's a lot of ways to get them done. But the way to figure it out, looking for the window, you keep looking so that you can spend your life's energies and the things that you decide are important, that you pursue them. I just want to add real quickly, sure. I'm so glad you asked that question. Every one of us has failed. You cannot be afraid to fail. It's okay to be discouraged. I always say embrace the terror. Mm -hmm. So when you're at that lowest moment, just embrace it. Go, yep, I'm in it, this sucks, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm gonna pick myself back up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I allow myself to have two or three days where I'm like, this is pity party, okay. And then you say, all right, I'm gonna get back up and I'm gonna do this. One very quick story, I ran a, a state assembly race and we won, but they didn't have enough people on staff 
to hire me on from the campaign. I didn't have a job, for a regular job, for six months. I was on a, a little bit of unemployment, a little bit here. I took a job at a political consulting company calling people to see if they wanted yard signs. I went from a list strategist to calling people if they wanted yard signs because it had anything to do remotely with what I wanted to do. And guess what? That helped me. It, that was a really yucky six months. but. I met some people through that that got me to my next job. And so sometimes you have to do things that you maybe don't want to do, maybe aren't the most glamorous thing, but just do that gut check and know I'm not this is not going to be me in a year, you in get two some years, grit in from three it. years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, ladies, Nina, That's Alejandra, Sarita, Jennifer, thank you all very thank much. You. Thank you to our audience. Thank you. That was a beautiful message. Now I know why you are the way you are. <laughs>Thank you very much uh, to our panelists and Erica. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Monica Gill, Executive Vice President of Corporate Affairs with NBC Universal Telemundo Enterprises. She is the highest ranking female executive at Telemundo and one of the highest ranking female executives at NBC Universal. The podium is yours, Monica. Hi, let's give the panel another round of applause, right? Uh, thank you. I get to give sponsor remarks, and, and thank you. Before I do that, I just want to thank The Hill for, for really convening this very exceptional group of women. Um, as you probably have heard this entire morning, I think for many of us in this room, we know firsthand that Latinas are the most coveted demographic in our country. And there's an American fascination with us, right? People want to know about our purchasing power. They want to know about our cuisine, our language, J-Lo. They want to know everything about us. And yet for much of America, what we really realize is that we are still the untapped potential for their growth. Latinas are enrolling in college at higher rates than our non-Latina counterparts. I just learned that. Latinas' own businesses are growing maybe, I think, something about 140% in the last decade. Latinas are more likely to make a major purchase in the last year, such as a home or a car. Latinas' brand recall is twice as much in Spanish as it is in English, so it's convenient to speak two languages. And what can I say? Latinas are more likely to purchase Aquanet than any other typical woman. <laughs> so that being said, as you see, our segment, what it is about our segment is that we actually equate growth for any business in America. So I thank The Hill for bringing all of us together to do what we Latinas, what we do best. We identify obstacles and then we fix them. At least we try to. So because of that, what our this is what our community has always truly been about. We are about perseverance and we are about solutions. Because I believe that despite the divisions in our country right now, and no matter where you stand in this political spectrum, we all have a unifying mission. We saw it yesterday with the unfortunate shootings. We all wanna feel safe. We all want to support each other. We are all thirsty for a quality nation. And that is why Telemundo is here today. Because like The Hill, like all of you, we have a responsibility to tell Latina stories, to create a generative conversation that educates and informs, that empowers our customers, and that embraces our history. Because like you, like all of you here, we want to encourage organizations to see us Latinas as we are, and not as past perceptions have expected us to behave. And ironically, as I stand here on this podium today, I recognize that I actually work in an industry that instantaneously creates perceptions. Immediately when you press a remote, when you click on your phone, or when you touch or hold a screen. It's a little bit ironic, right? But at the same time, think about that for a second. It is so powerful. It's such a titanic responsibility. Because at the end of the day, let's be clear. Perceptions matter. And because of this, Telemundo has made a very deliberate choice. We made a choice to upgrade all of perceptions of Spanish language media that reflect us Latinos as we are today, 100% American and 100% Latino. We made the decision to redefine Hispanic media and to fill that void that Latinos have been demanding, high quality content and information, new formats and new storylines. And we did this because so whether that you're a Cubana in Miami, whether you're a Puerto Rican in New York, a Mexicana in LA or a Dominicana in DC, that you are represented on our air, in our newsroom and in our boardrooms. 
And I don't say this lightly because to me and to all of you here, um, I know that to my company as well, this is personal. This is a personal conversation to all of us because if companies across America were to adjust a little bit and if they were to invest in Latinas, you're gonna see the Nina Vacas of the world who truly epitomize entrepreneurship. You will see Jenny Korn who advises and advocates at their nation's highest office. You will see women like Jackie Puente, my colleague, who's closing the digital divide in our community. And you will see Telemundo, a Spanish language network, catapult to be the number one slot irrespective of language in key markets. You will also think, who would have thought this 10 years ago? Who would have thought that we'd be the world rights, uh, the, the, the uh, official broadcaster for the World Cup. All of this is happening and I share this with you because my point is that all of these things collectively remind me that Latinos, Latinas, Spanish is here to stay. So with that, on behalf of Telemundo, Luis Rosero, my colleague who is here today and represents Telemundo and our parent company, Comcast, we thank all of you for allowing us to be here. We thank you for helping us to continue to make perceptions that matter and for reassuring us to inform with integrity and for propelling us to lead with compassion. Gracias. Thank you so much, Monica, for your empowering comments. This morning has been filled with a series of thought-provoking conversations. Uh, to round out these discussions, we now want to turn our attention to the role of diversity in the age of digital media. Please join me in welcoming on stage Monica Lozano, Chairman of the Latinos and Society Program at the Aspen Institute and former Chairman of U.S. Hispanic Media. Monica is also the former publisher and CEO of La Opinión, the largest and most influential Hispanic newspaper in the country. Also with us is Shirley Velasquez. She's the executive editor of peopleinespanol.com and Chica, an English language vertical about the lives of American Latinos on people.com. An expert in pop culture and digital content, Shirley speaks publicly about the lives of American Latinos and the importance of empowering women in the workplace. And finally joining us will be Michelle Salcedo, the desk editor at the Associated Press. Michelle is a member of the board at the National Press Club and is a past president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Okay. Erica Gonzalez, reporter and anchor with NBC4, is back for this conversation. The floor is yours, hey. Erica. <laughs> I can sit close to you. All right. <laughs> okay. Vamos a seguir platicando, no? Okay. All right. So, same as our last panel, I'll kind of pose some questions that anybody can chime in on, and then we'll try to get to some specific questions based on uh, your career paths and your different organizations. So, let's talk broadly about some of the benefits of a more diverse, a more inclusive media. Mm -hmm. Open for anybody to chime in. Sure, I, I'll start because um, it was interesting coming off of what Monica here was talking about, which has to do with the demographic changes. We all understand the power and the potential of the Hispanic market, the fact that we're the second largest, we're the second fastest growing, we consume media, um, over index and everything social, video, mobile, and yet there is a fairly significant disparity between um, seeing Latinos in media versus our consumption of media. And there's lots of studies that talk about how our image, in fact, it was um, Nina who said, you can't be what you don't see. Right, and right. if we don't see ourselves in media, and if we aren't the people who are actually making the decisions about what goes on the air, um, we have this disconnect between how America views our community and how we ourselves understand our contributions. Shirley, want to chime in on that? Yeah, I, thank you. Thank you for having me, first of Absolutely. all. Absolutely. And um, it's very interesting because I now work at Time Inc. And um, it's one of the companies where I've actually seen um, diversity in action. And I work with a lot of people um, who are Latino, who are of Asian origin, who are African American, and who are, you know, who are at top executive levels. So um, I see the difference between that and other places where I've worked where that hasn't been the case. And essentially, for me, it boils down to having that advocate in the room 
to say, you know, this is a story or this is a vertical or this is a, you know, a series that really speaks to a group of people that that does not see itself represented in mainstream media. And in the, you know, in the time that I've been there, I've just seen that kind of content become more important, more and more important, partly because of the stats you you just mentioned mm -hmm. and the person before just mentioned, but partly because we um, have also shown up to consume that content and have been have been just voicing our opinions more and, and, and interacting more. So I am seeing a change, you know, slow to come, but still it, it, I think it's in the midst of happening. Michelle, Shirley, let me ask you, do you think that it's because you already have good people at the top to where it makes you a little bit more comfortable to even go and pose that discussion and say, we need to be on this? I think that if you don't have the leadership at the top and the commitment mm -hmm. at the top, it's not going to trickle, trickle down. down. Right. It's, much easy, it's much more difficult mm -hmm. to be at a lower level and try to push up and try to affect that change uh, from the bottom. Mm -hmm. It can be done, but it takes much, much longer. And going to Shirley's point and, and Monica's point as well, um, if you, you can have people in those leadership positions, but if you don't have Latinos or Latinas throughout the organization to help management figure out how you're going to implement that plan. I mean, I think people have been saying, organizations have. I got it. Thank you. Have yes. been saying for 30 years, um, not starting, but certainly recognized by Time Magazine. I think it was in the 70s, the year of the Hispanic. <laughs> Um, you know, we're still kind of we're still kind of waiting for that year, and we keep being told that it's our year and it's our year. But somehow, the year goes by, and we're still kind of in the same place. So, if you don't have that middle management layer, and you don't have a pipeline of people coming up, um, you know, sort of extending your hand back and bringing them into the organization, especially larger organizations like Tribune, like Time, like the AP. Um, you're not going to, it's not going to be easy to implement mm -hmm. those plans and mm -hmm. it's going to take much, much longer. Let me also pose this question and anybody can chime in on this. What do you all see as some of the greatest failures of contemporary media when it comes to providing for their audiences, the communities? They should reflect the community that they serve. Mm -hmm. I would, I think, um, I think about it in two ways because on the one hand, you know, major media companies, like all companies, recognize the demographics. They know that they have to be relevant and, um, you know, be able to reach audiences with content that they care about. And so they're they're trying to find ways in which they can um, begin to move in that direction. But the the measurements very often lead them to do things that are about engagement. Mm -hmm. So um, is it a story that gets more eyeballs as opposed to it is a story that really empowers communities, that provides information that will benefit the individual who's consuming it? And I think that there's a real tension there between following the eyeballs versus doing things that are issue oriented, that are advocacy mm -hmm. based, that will elevate um, our community by giving them the information that is empowering. And, and that is clearly one of the tensions that's going on in media today. Can we talk about, because um, we're talking about media, the, would you all say that there are unique differences in, in, in our business, in media, for Latinas to be able to ascend the ranks? Is it something different about our industry, or would you say it's the same, it's the same set of challenges for Latinas across the board, no matter the industry, or is it different for our industry? I think that because media, especially, um, has such a powerful message, that the person who can, the, the person or the group of people who controls that message, um, people don't want to give that up. So. I think that that makes it a little bit more uh, difficult because the stakes are higher. You are going to, a Latina is going to bring her perspective into the news meeting. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that when somebody says, oh, let's cover immigration and let's go into the Latino community, somebody's going to stand up and say, the Latina hopefully will say, excuse me, but most of our people were born here. So you need to go into a different community. Yeah, that, that's a really, for me, a difficult question to answer because part of what I'm seeing is 
the many new ways that Latinas and Latinos can enter um, the, the, you know, enter enter the world of news or the world of information media, and part of that is through these social platforms. And so, you know, and, and the shift that I've seen from the val the, the value placed on um, on news and data shifting toward you know more of an entertainment having more of an entertainment scope. So, there definitely has been some kind of opening of um, of this very uh, elite world that perhaps didn't exist before. Um, but that said, to reach those higher ranks and to reach those positions of, um, of decision making that you know, that have that, that impact the lives of so many people beyond the Latino community, I still see as that being very unreachable for a lot of Latinas. And I think that part of it is like you guys are saying is making sure that there's people at all levels um, holding each other's hand because you know, at some point, there's, there's, there's this. This industry is in such um, uh, revolution that um, the changes happen at the top very quickly. You know, they, they happen all throughout the business very quickly. I, I also think, though, it's a very empowering moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, information is in the hands of consumers, and so the social platforms allow for people to actually create content, to share content, to curate, mm -hmm. to be in communities, to use devices and platforms that actually um, begin to now reflect who we are in, in more authentic and, and meaningful ways. So we're still challenged, I think, in the traditional media companies. Mm -hmm. But when you look at all the bloggers, the influencers, the social networks, it's, it's multi-language, it's multi-generational. And I also think this is a very empowering moment for people to understand that you can actually use these tools to begin to change the narrative. You don't have to wait until you know, large media institutions you know, figure out ways in which they can do it. And so I think the, the blend between an empowered you know, community using technology and communication tools and devices is going to start to change because mm -hmm. people understand that you know this is and the last thing i would say is um, you know media is a it's a profession where you can marry you know your sense of purpose and passion mm -hmm. with a profession and so many journalists go into this because they have this keen sense of wanting to improve the world, to change mm -hmm. the world, to use these um, communication True. tools to actually empower. And I think for Latinas in particular, it's a fantastic space to be mm -hmm. in. Shirley, so let me continue kind of, you, you know, you mm -hmm. touched on it here. So in speaking about media, would you say then that digital, digital platforms, digital spaces have the most flexibility right now to be able to get in, get your foot in the door, and then be able to move around once you're there. I, mean, I, that's I, I think so. I think so because, um, you know, and I started on print media many years ago and then made the transition. And, you know, I remember having to have a certain, you know, there was a sense of like that you had to master so many things in terms of critical thinking, in terms of the way you amassed information and data, and being able to, you know, tell that story and then learning the craft of storytelling. There was so much you needed to you know, um, to understand and, and, and coalesce around the publication of a piece. And now what I see is a lot less emphasis on having that understanding and a lot more emphasis on just tell the story, get it out there as soon as you can. Um, and, you know, and that's for better or worse, a lot, the way a lot of publications are now working. And, and there's a lot of resistance within these organizations because they don't want to see, um, they don't want to see the, the value of, of of um, interpretation being diminished, and, um, and and neutrality, and so. But to answer your question, yes, I think there's a lot more opportunity now. There's a, you know, especially at these lower levels of media to come in and 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 not necessarily have um, the background that was once expected. And that is, I mean, that, and that, and there's some ways that that's good because it allows a, a variety of people to come in to tell stories and to get their story told or to tell other people's stories. But in another way, we have to be careful to make sure that we're, you know, um, sharing the important, the important pieces of journalism, which is accuracy and neutrality, and being objective and telling the truth ultimately and bearing witness. All right, Michelle. Let me ask you: Do you think it's possible for strong, established media services to prioritize diversity for it to be more than just wishful thinking? Yes, we do it. We have some in our newsroom to really make it a focus, to really make it a priority. Is, that, is it possible? I think it is possible, and I've, I've seen it happen um, when Sharon Rosenhaus was the 
uh, managing editor at the South Florida Sun Sentinel, she was absolutely committed to making sure that the staff of the paper reflected the South Florida community. That meant hiring more Latinos, more African Americans, more Asians. It was a program that she had brought from uh, the paper in San Francisco, where she had uh, been the managing editor for a number of years. It was successful there. It was successful in South Florida. And we saw our numbers go from, I would say, uh, mid-teens for uh, journalists of color and to um, the mid-20s wow. um, within a matter of a year and a half or two years. So with a commitment from the top, <clears throat> it's possible. Mm -hmm. Michael, let me ask you about um, the benefits of media outlets that are solely focused on Spanish language as their way to reach their viewers, to reach their audience, to reach their readers. Yeah, well, I grew up in Spanish language media, of course, um, publishing La Opinión first in Los Angeles, and then we went national, and we were in 10 of the largest Hispanic markets with Spanish language media. And the beauty of it, of course, is that that is who you are. And so everything you do, the way you cover issues, you bring to it a Latino perspective. You're not just covering Latino issues, because as we've heard before, there's no such thing as just a Latino issue. But how you go into City Hall, how you cover the major institutions, you're just thinking constantly about what does this information mean for my community, and how do I convert it into actually something that becomes a tool for empowerment? Mm -hmm. So there was, I can remember over the years, you know, people, oh, well, you're all, you know, it's about advocacy journalism. And you know what? It's public service journalism. It's knowing who your audience is, and it's doing what's right for them. Mm -hmm. And if it turns out that you're advocating, so be it. Because at the end of the day, we have an important responsibility to use our networks, our, um, our capacity to really empower communities. Now, that is very different than those organizations that have to serve a more general market. And, and Latino media, Spanish language media, is transitioning. It's not about Spanish anymore. It's about content, and content that is relevant and that speaks to the issues that people care about. Because as we've heard earlier, the majority of um, US-born Latinos are English speakers, obviously. So that is the next generation. Would you all say that there is a set of, or a skill set, I should say, that you would say, get this under your belt ASAP? You know, learn this trait as quickly as you can in order to, you know, kind of a story of, if I knew now, or if I knew then what I know now, maybe things would have been different, or maybe I could have shaved some time off of, you know, the trials and, and all of the effort, right, in the career. But would you say, if you can do this, master this now, what would it be? I would say for me, um, I wish I had taken a statistics class <laughs> okay. in college. Um, because so much of um, so so much of the way that we're telling stories today on the digital side and, and on print also um, has to do with you know with metrics and with analytics and learning to use a lot of the platforms are out there like Google Analytics or Omniture, which is a much clunkier one, or um, Parsley. There's so many great platforms out there, and what I find is that. Um, for me, you know, the numbers take a long time for me still um, to, to, to look at them and to interpret them. And it took me a while to become comfortable with spreadsheets and, you know, that, right. that and then, but then the fun part, the rewarding part for my, for my, the journalist in me is interpreting that data, fact checking it, and then telling a story and then fact checking that story. And, um, and so I, yeah, I wish that I, that I had done that. And I would say that, and then the, sort of the old school, but the old school, um, you know, the previous tech uh, talent that I would say is just, you know, developing that ability to stay present when you're in the, when you're, you know, when you're, when you're reading a number, when you're reading just either a story or interviewing one, I think that that becomes that level, the power of observation mm -hmm. still reigns supreme, I think, in, in, in no matter what industry. And, and I think developing that as a, as a skill today still really matters. We talked a little bit in our previous um, panel about reaching out to somebody and if you think you've got their ear to hang on to them, right, so that you can ask those questions and don't get discouraged if you don't get an email, you know, two days later, three days later, maybe even a week later, it takes some time. But how do you establish mentorship in the workplace to extend the hand, to pull up, and to keep that door open? Are there, are there groups that need to be set up, or is it simply having these one-on-one -on -one discussions with um, colleagues, with those that are coming in? 
how do we establish the mentorship in the workplace? Or is it maybe as simple as, you know, sometimes it's not convenient to make yourself available. Right. Um, but you have to if we want things to change, right? Right. Um, one of the things I've done is that I, I love. I'm like I have this very strong inner rebel, and I love when you know, and I love when it's 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 women, especially young women or men, but women, Latinas who um, who don't have the background that would have ordinarily gotten them in the door. I'm constantly on the look for that. And I make sure, you know, I share, I talk about that because I want to make sure that my colleagues also keep that in mind yeah. when they're hiring or, you know, anyone I'm working with. And I'm, I'm looking for the desire. So, so essentially it's, you know, anyone who puts themselves in front of me, even if it's a connection to someone I know, or, you know, there are many ways to help really transition someone along their journey. And, um, and it's literally where there's desire in the will, I think that, that you know, that I'm, I, I love, like, you know, sharing what I have, because it allows me also to learn, you know, to learn how to update my own knowledge and my own way of helping. And I think that um, I talk about that a lot at work and the need to help each other, especially in environments that are really stressful, because that's like one of the first things that goes out the window is remembering to help um, el prójimo. So, you know, that, that's one way for me is to just be on the lookout for me to be alert and giving back. I want to go to the audience now. So if you have been thinking, I uh, want to make sure that we have a couple of minutes for some questions. So if you've got some questions that are specific or general, that's fine. Um, love to see you raise your hand. And we'll come to you in the front row, please, first. Hi, Monica Gonzalez with Vista Strategies. And Monica, I know I've known you for quite a long time. And you've um, been such a trailblazer and a leader um, on corporate boards and other forums. How do you handle adversity? What's your advice on dealing with adversity? Oh, that's a great question, Monica. Um, how do you handle adversity? Um, I keep it very private. You know, there were some women that were on the earlier panel that talked about, um, you know, how it is that you sort of manage your image. Um, I think it was Geisha who was talking about it. And I very often, you know, try to just understand what happened, internalize it at the moment, go back and reflect on it, and lessons learned. Um, but I do recognize that when women show weakness in the moment, it's interpreted in a different way than if it was a man that had to go through something. So I am very stoic. I hold it in. I go back and I reflect. And then I learn from that and then try to adjust going forward. But there is something about you know, demonstrating um, what could be construed as a, a sense of weakness um, among your coworkers, among the people that you're reporting up to. And so I think um, you know, it's just one of those things that you try to you know, learn from mistakes, um, overcome them in whatever way you can. But I am very careful about protecting my image um, among those who I think have um, the authority or the opportunity to actually make a determination if I'm going to go up or I'm going to go sideways. Anybody else in the audience? Another question? Yes, over there. I see you. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much. This panel has been very informational. Um, following up with your uh, conversation about image, it's very important for us to market ourselves. So what is the best way for Latinas to market ourselves? Obviously, when you have the skill set, you prove yourself in the workforce. Mm -hmm. But as Latinas, there's always that, um, there's always that I don't know, from, especially from other groups, um, that they tend to undervalue us. Mm -hmm. So how can you, um, how can Latinas learn to uh, market ourselves so that we can rise to the top? I think it's really important to project confidence, to be confident in yourself, to be confident in your skills, to be confident in what you can do and in your interactions with others and what you bring to the table. You're not. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses, but to know what your particular set of strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. are, I think helps uh, when you're putting yourself forward into the marketplace. And of course, those strengths and those skills are always changing, um, depending on circumstances and you, you gain new skills over time. So you have a better sense of how you can convince a company or a client that you are the best person for that job. 
The only thing I would add to that too is that, um, you know, I think many of us have a tendency and, you know, we're such hard workers, we're at it, we sit at our desks and we want to complete the project and we want to be like good young workers or good, good workers. And I think it's um, for me remembering to, to put that aside, you know, almost to calendarize that and to regularly get out and, and connect with other people and, you know, to find opportunities where I can promote what I've learned or discuss what I've learned. And, and you know, and, and it's, you know, you're talking about confidence and it's like, yes, let, let me be confident enough in my skills that I can put like my day to day aside and get out and do something different and, and step away from the work um, to grow as, because that's essentially how I'm going to keep, you know, ri you know rising in, in, in the corporate workforce or wherever it is. Um, so yeah, it's nurturing that piece of yourself and I mean, remembering also that. Add to that, that it may be difficult you know, to be that introspective and to self-analyze and because maybe you think because of our humble backgrounds, I don't want to say that about myself. Right. Sit down with somebody that you are confident or that you can trust, that you can have some honest mm -hmm. conversations with, a mentor that you can say, can you help me? I think this, I think these are my strong suits. It's hard for me to see them when I look in the mirror. Can I hear what you would think or what you would say and have, be able to ask for help. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if you don't know the answer, and it's hard to sometimes say those things about yourself because you feel like you're gloating or, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay to ask for help and to, to, to hear it from somebody, somebody that's sitting on the opposite side of the table as you. I think maybe one more question and then we'll go after that. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Thank you. Good morning and thank you so much for this great conversation. Um, Women in the media and what you're seeing now with the women's marches and the movement and the activity um, that's happening all over, not just the country, but the world. Can you talk a little bit about maybe your expectation or what you, um, what your perception was after the marches in January as, um, you know, kind of this is your bailiwick in your wheelhouse? Anybody? <clears throat> well, I, you can, I think a big difference between the marches in the 60s and 70s and the marches today is the marches in the 60s and 70s had a plan to connect to power. It wasn't just about turning out numbers in the streets. Mm -hmm. And then there was somehow an expectation that things were going to change. There was pressure put on elected officials. There were people who ran for office. There were people who, um, who wrote letters. There were consciousness raising groups in order to empower ourselves and each other. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing that now. Um, and that, I think, is um, a, a significant disconnect. And we need to really, we have the numbers. We've demonstrated we have the numbers. Um, now we need to hold people accountable and say, OK, this is who we are. We elected you, and we cannot elect you too. I, I just wanted to, it's not specific to women or to the women's marches, right. but I've reflected a lot on this question of changing the narrative, mm -hmm. um, whether it's around women's issues or Latino issues and where we find ourselves today um, in you know, 2017. And you know, when over two thirds of all Latinos say that mainstream media does not reflect who they are as a community, and yet it is that imagery that is being absorbed by others who then create you know, a, a sense of um, understanding or misunderstanding. So I think we have a real obligation right now to really interface directly um, with media and to use it as a way to mm -hmm. begin to change the narrative, mm -hmm. to understand that, in fact, we are empowered and we can begin to um, redefine the way Latinos are perceived in this country by using these tools of, of media and communication. It's an extraordinary opportunity when there's such a misalignment mm -hmm. that creates an opportunity. And I think lots of companies are trying to figure out how do I actually begin to understand, reflect, and communicate who Latinos are in America and what we mean to this country going forward. And I would use this as an opportunity to take those tools and, and use them for an empowerment. Se nos acabó el tiempo. We've got it. Monica, Shirley, Michelle, thank, thank you so very much thank for you your very time much. and your insight. Thank you. thank you very much for your questions. That's our panel. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, ladies, for such a powerful conversation. This brings us to the end of the program this morning. On behalf of The Hill Latino and our sponsors, PG&E and Telemundo, I would like to thank all of you in the room and those of you who tuned in to the live stream. If you missed any portion of the discussion, the full event video will be available on thehill.com shortly. And please continue to follow The Hill Latino online and through social media. As a reminder, please be sure to fill out our event feedback survey. You can hand your forms to any member of The Hill staff on your way out. Muchisimas gracias.